We are presenting today on making tacos for hydras, um, this obnoxious coloring. Uh, this is the presentation that you hopefully have showed up for. <laughs> um, I am Christina Harlow, and uh, I am joined here by Hannah Frost, and we work at Stanford, um, AKA the Death Star of the San Vera Library community. <laughs> Only half joking, although I want to be a stormtrooper, so. <laughs> Um, okay, so this is our presentation. You'll see uh, there are slides available at a bit.ly, bit.ly uh, Hydra's Tacos, capital H, capital T. There's some links and diagrams and stuff that you know, it might be helpful to have on hand if you really want to deep dive into it, though it should be fine. Okay, so before we get started, I wanted to uh, thank some people that have been involved in making this work actually happen. Uh, taco is something that's taken a couple years of effort. In particular, I wanted to call out Aaron Fahey, who used to work at Stanford and was pivotal, like really, really important to getting this off the ground when we first started uh, thinking about what became Taco. And she's now at Protocol Labs, and so you can tweet at her and ask all your IPFS questions if you have them. Um, and then also, this is a work effort that spans a lot of different people in the Stanford libraries, not even uh, just in digital library systems and services, which is the department that Hannah and I work within, but uh, our colleagues in metadata, our colleagues in special collections, university archives, across the board, there's been a lot of effort to try to figure out what we're doing here. So I wanted to call out a thanks to them as well. Um, and finally, <laughs> if you're wondering why I chose such uh, obnoxious colors, uh, I saw this Boots Riley film recently called Sorry to Bother You, which is pretty hilarious and I would highly recommend you check it out. It's um, an absurdist dark comedy that's magical realism and science fiction inspired by the world of telemarketing, which just sounds brilliant and reminds me of my job in some ways. So <laughs> um, there's a lot of gifts and coloring and theming from that just as a sort of fun, it's afternoon, it's after lunch, I want to keep you awake, hence this. Okay, so today's talk, what we would like to do is start off by introducing you to the Stanford Digital Repository. This is meant to set the context of the work that we did and explain why we made some of the decisions we did. Um, I also uh, think it's interesting to talk with people uh, from various communities who know a lot of my Stanford colleagues or myself, but maybe don't know a lot about the kind of system we're actually trying to work with and move forward. So starting there, thank you. Um, the second goal would be sharing uh, our, our approaches to how we went about re-architecting um, the Stanford Digital Repository. This is some of the process stuff because it, in the end, a lot of the work we needed to do was not only technical, it was a lot of uh, social and cultural change. So we were gonna share some of how we approached it. Finally, we're gonna walk through our new architecture, which um, the architecture itself is called Cosino. Uh, because I am always hungry and I really like tacos. It started with taco and it just sort of blossomed from there. So you'll see a lot of food puns. Um, hashtag dad jokes. So uh, we'll walk through the architecture of the data models and what we've actually prototyped so far. Um, for this particular conference, I've added a separate section where we're gonna discuss community overlap. I know that's one of the concerns um, among many projects right now within Sam Vera. And so we wanna discuss how we're actively trying to foster that and then finally outline our next steps, what we're trying to do next. Throughout all of this, a lot of it is um, a chance for us to get out of our uh, Stanford echo chamber. I really want to get your feedback. I really want to hear what you think about this. Even if you think it's crap, that's OK. <laughs> um, so you can always reach out to us. You can email us. You can find us on Slack. Um, if you email me, I, it might take a couple months for me to respond because I'm really behind on email, but we want to get your feedback. So a lot of this is about that. And on that note, special props to the people who went through a very, very fast abbreviated version of this work in our workshop on Tuesday. So thank you very much for that. Okay, um, most of what I'm going to be covering is in very rough narrative form at this GitHub page. Um, I'm trying to put the last year of work, uh, documentation, GitHub repos, what code we've made, what infrastructure decisions we've made, policy decisions, all of this sort of stuff, into one single place that's a narrative that's a little bit easier to digest if you haven't been in the, you know, the trenches, so to speak. Um, it, is, uh, it still has some typos, it's still uh, a work in progress, but it's there, it's public, and it's meant to be a place where you can land if you're just like, what the hell are you talking about with this taco thing? 
Okay, so SDR. I'm grateful to the tech who got me the pointer so I could point on to this slide in particular. Good timing. Um, so I'm just going to be up here for a few moments. I've been at Stanford pretty much through the generation of this entire system. Um, and I'm the product owner for components of this very large system that Christina is going to talk about more in depth, but some introductory slides. So this is our current iteration of the Stanford Digital Repository, SDR. Uh, it is version two. We won't talk about version one. Um, <laughs> it's been in place for basically a decade, a really long time in repository years, right? Um, and it's basically been guided by these three spheres. There's the management sphere, the preservation sphere, and access. And so if you could overlay a hydra on this, the heads would be mostly in, if, in our world, in our vision, in our zoo of hydras. The, <laughs> the heads of the hydra would mostly be in the management sphere, and the body of the, of the beast is mostly somewhere in between. Well, it's actually, here, I'll use my pointer. Right there. <laughs> That's where Fedora 3 is. Um, it's where it takes in the objects and we begin the actual management. And then we push stuff down into the body, the preservation core. Um, and then access is, by, you know, by some extent, it's another, another version of the heads. But we've really, I've always thought of the heads of Hydra being more on the management side. Um, over the decade that we've developed this system, we've had a variety of digital contents and resources coming in in a variety of ways. A long list here. Um, of course, the ingest of things coming through our digitization labs with varying degree of automation feeding the repository. We get a lot of bulk collections, existing digital things, we call it third-party content that's just thrown over to us. We're currently bringing in 10,000 Pakistani books, 50,000 Rumsey maps, um, and manuscripts of variety sources. Uh, institutional repository self-deposit, that's from small research data sets, honors theses, variety of articles, those kinds of things. Um, bigger research data coming in in you know, lots of manual ways. Uh, geo data sets, its own workflow, its own system underlying everything. Web archiving, its own system underlying everything. And then electronic resources coming in in a variety of ways depending on their size. So over, over this time, we've accumulated over a million and a half individual objects, lots of other files included in those objects. We have over a half a petabyte of digital assets in the preservation system itself, and nearly half a petabyte of digital assets waiting to go into the repository in various stages of, of readiness um, or sort of in, in Fedora in process. Um, we have 69 terabytes of digital assets just like out there in the access systems and nearly 60 gigabytes of metadata out there as well. We're currently ingesting about 10 terabytes per month, but we literally just this week released a tool because we all of our accessioning has been basically going through one person Ben Albritton, if you know him, poor guy. And, um, but we recently added some, uh, a way, some tooling to distribute that work. So we expect to go up to 30 terabytes a month pretty soon. Pretty cool, right? Okay, <laughs> bravo, we're awesome. <laughs> the problem with all of this is, I mean, it's wonderful. We have a lot to be proud of. But the problem with all of this is that We've had really inconsistent levels of resourcing and practices throughout all of this. And you got a sense for just kind of how varied and complicated it is. So that sets the stage for... Yay. <laughs> so yeah, um, when I first started at Stanford, uh, which is about a year and a half ago, I was coming from Cornell, where um, we would have multiple different systems to deal with like, oh, web archiving, that's, that's this repository and this or um, coming from this particular school's uh, institutional deposit. We'll, we'll have it over here. Uh, and so Stanford was just so bewildering to me, the SDR, because all of those different contents were going into a system. I saw the three-sphere diagram, and then I saw the code bases. And I was like, where the hell do those things overlap? So I started by, um, and a, a group of us uh, did this current state exercise I'll describe later. Uh, but what I have up here is from last summer, an overview of a subset of the code bases that I pulled just from our GitHub organization that are involved in our current Stanford Digital Repository system. 
And depending on what you want to count as a code base that we manage, there's something around or above 100 code bases involved in the Stanford Digital Repository System across hundreds of VMs. Um, so when you're dealing with that, it gets a little bit tricky to understand where the actual implementation relates to the architectural design that was led by an architect that uh, just retired after 35 years. So that was a lovely transition point as well. With that, um, we want to go to uh, how we wanted to re-architect. Well, looking at the system in this way, we already know we have some pretty well identified pain points. Um, I'm not going to go into too much detail uh, about them, but if you're a masochist, they're all described on that GitHub page site that I was telling you about earlier. Uh, two of our self-deposit applications, because we have multiple um, ingest applications, two of them are really early or proto-Hydra Rails apps, and they just never got updated to be fully Sambera. Um, we had uh, a, a preservation system that we just spent a full year rebuilding. So that's something that we're not thinking about necessarily in our re-architecture, but now that it has been rebuilt, uh, we're thinking about how our management sphere can interact with it where it's not so tightly coupled, because that's something that we have as a blocker on a lot of our workflows and processing currently. Uh, we knew that one of our core issues was that all of our metadata is stored in Fedora 3, and we want to get off of Fedora 3. This is not just the issue of it's in Fedora 3 and we have to go to something else, but active Fedora and Fedora data models are all through those code bases that I outlined. So it's, it's much less like taking one uh, block out and putting one in, and much more like pulling the thread of a sweater and then you lose an arm. Uh, so we're trying to figure that out. And then there was, uh, we have a eight or nine year old asynchronous processing system that's tightly coupled to a state machine that's driven by an Oracle table. And so we were trying to figure out how to replace that. I, at one point recently, um, our department head was actually saying, I'm waiting to see what that silver bullet plan is that's going to help us get to a re-architecture. And I responded almost within, uh, without thinking, but we have more than one werewolf, so <laughs> it's going to have to have more than one bullet. <laughs> um, so thinking about that, uh, SDR, the future of re-architecting SDR was not something that just came up in the last year and a half. It's been discussed for a couple of years now. And depending on who you asked, you would get a different understanding of what the re-architecture was supposed to be. For some, it was about you know, really introducing some linked open data practices. For others, it was trying to get us more in line with the Sambera community. For yet others, it was trying to take the core code bases we already had and make them actually support web archiving better, or to have better accessioning, or more uh, functionalities that administrators could take on. And I think one of the issues that we had and why it took so long to get this re-architecture even written down in a consistent way is that we had these information silos, so it was, there was no clear conception of what we were trying to do other than to be transformative, other than it was going to be different than what we had now. And so that led us to starting uh, not with, hey, let's design the ideal in state. That led us to starting about a year ago with going, what actually is current SDR? What is SDR2 with that whole group of people involved? And it's very much like if you're working in, the, let's, for example, if you're one of the Samvera developers who really hadn't touched core code beyond that point that wasn't Hydra or Hydra adjacent, then you wouldn't know the mess of robots until you were forced to go work on it. So it was a lot of like, we need to get that common understanding. So to do that, we did a reset. Uh, there was a couple things we did for the re-architecture. We started with an SDR retrospective. The whole department was asked what, what, like, to do a retrospective on the current system. Pain points, things that work well, what would you like to change, what do you least understand, what do you feel like you most understand? And it gave some enlightening answers that we'll see in a second. We did a current state analysis. I know data flow diagrams are oh so 1990, but they're really helpful if you had something that was supposed to be microservices and then became a micro monolith and you're trying to figure out how all the code bases work. So we basically went through, if I drop something in one of these five ingest points, how does it get to preservation and how does it get to access sphere? How does it get to our, our SearchWorks Blacklight catalog? Um, we did a design cycle, um, which I'm going to talk more about in a second. We did a prototype work cycle after the design cycle where we actually wanted to test what we were saying we wanted to uh, build out. We'll talk more about that. We started a SDR policy working group. Um, I know policy is people's, particularly I would imagine in this community, policy is not people's favorite word, 
But if because we had so many misunder, uh, miscommunication about what SDR was and what we were trying to build, we felt like having this sort of coordination point for those kind of questions would really help, and it's something that's still going on. We had a metadata working group, so we're trying to figure out how to better su uh, best support the growing non-MARC metadata staff, um, our, our colleagues in the other department. And we did community feedback sessions, which will be one of the last things I discussed today. So for that retrospective, it was interesting to get feedback um, on what we were currently doing, because everyone had a different piece of the elephant. Some of the takeaways that I want to point out here uh, overall, there was just lack of full system comprehension. People, if you had to debug something, everything was so coupled and folks only had such a small understanding of a limited scope of it that it would take really a, far longer than it should and more developers than it should to find out that it was a missing bracket in XML that caused the error or something akin to that. We had lots of unmaintained code bases and workflows. One of my favorite things about the current state exercise was it turned up um, two or three Java code bases that were living on a VM and happily being a core point that connected our digital repository and our ILS. Um, but one of them wasn't even under version control. Nobody actually under, uh, remembered that they were running there and that they were an important component. Lots of unmaintained code bases and workflows that we needed to figure out. We had a lot of over-engineered components on the flip side, things that we thought we were gonna do and then we forgot or we got attached to a different project or a new grant came through. And we said, oh, shoot, why did we make this abstraction again? Well, who are you going to do with that? We never got back to it. Um, and then a lot of pain points in adding new features and processes. Um, web archiving is a good example because it wasn't necessarily that it was a technical issue. We, did have a, we have a good data model and a good workflow for getting it integrated in our repository. But it was a developer working by himself. Uh, before we really tried to fix our developer practices, and it sort of just got duct taped on the side of our current system, and it causes, uh, it, it's the one uh, code base that actually caused so many Honey Badger errors, we had to start paying for Honey Badger. Like, there's a lot of pain points in adding these features because of the lack of understanding. And then there was um, overall a mismatch of design and implementation. Our previous architect, um, he was quite brilliant and had some really great conceptual ideas, had done a lot of specifications, uh, but that wasn't necessarily what got implemented. And it's not that it was, um, it was more a lack of communication or developers sort of working on their own in silos, led to, oh, I'm gonna approach it this way and I'm gonna connect to Fedora directly instead of using this REST API that was set up for this purpose, uh, practices like that. And this is just a quote from one of the engineers in that retro that I think highlights what we were trying to do and it's gonna set up um, how we were trying to take apart our system to actually migrate it to something else. There are a lot of interaction points between layers of the technology stack and you often have to know about all of those interactions even if you're only concerned with a part of the stack. So we didn't really do microservices very well and now that we wanted to migrate components, we didn't even know how we would start. Again, think of that sweater. So we went into a design cycle. Um, this was both appreciated for the work, but hated because it was three months of daily one hour meetings with all the people who had different <coughs> conceptions of what our, our new architecture would be. And instead of focusing on implementation first, which had not served us very well, i.e. jumping to, we're gonna use um, LDP, we're gonna use uh, curation concerns or Hyrax, we took a step back and said, okay, what are we actually trying to serve? What are our functional requirements here, at least for parity of the current system? and then built up from that. So we produced requirements, we built a shared understanding, and we generated uh, what became Cosina, which is uh, our conceptual design. Uh, this is the current state deep dive. Um, so this is the, uh, uh, the thing I was discussing earlier. You can see a variety <laughs> of some really insane diagrams. We have these for uh, most of the code bases you saw on that original slide uh, to work through it. And we um, also have, uh, originally this was proposed as part of our roadmap to get to SDR3 and it's become a larger practice and owned differently, but the idea of maintenance work cycles. So when in between any sort of grant or bigger um, core development work cycle, have that team work on some maintenance issues uh, because we have so much technical debt. So this led to what we called, uh, what we call now Cosina, our, our uh, taco truck, and I'll explain the names in a second. Um, and we started with some goals before going into that development work cycle. Uh, and 
The goals, you can see where they come from uh, in the previous work. We wanted to move off Fedora 3. We had spent some time before actually trying to implement um, Hyrax in, as one of our self-deposit apps, because we know that our self-deposit apps need to be updated. They're a pain point. But what we found is we were building a house with no plumbing, and so we wanted to revisit what our middleware should be, and starting with Fedora 3 and figuring out how we're going to replace that is where we decided to, to go. We knew we wanted to have convergence with open source um, projects and communities. We did not want to end up with um, a zombie early Hydra head living on its own little space with no ability to actually update it to the code that was being produced by the community. We wanted to have expanded data models and functions. Um, we, were, we used Fedora 3 uh, data model and data streams to the point where we had something, we have at least 30 known data streams. We were expanding the XML all over the place. We didn't do retroactive or retrospective cleanup whenever something in the data model changed. So we wanted to figure out how to better approach that and make it a little bit more flexible for when new object types come through, like born digital email archives. Um, we wanted to replace problematic components in SDR, which you saw earlier. And then, okay, I completely own that I made this up because it's kind of a bullshit term, but data for a technical architecture approaches, yeah, that's me. I thought, like, I think there was a lot we could do to not have complex systems but complex data and start thinking about how we have data specifications that are not hard-coded in, like, the Rails controllers. Or, <laughs> thank you, Jeremy, I'll pay you $10 later. <laughs> Um, so it, it was that in combination with um, how do we, how we can't really support horizontal scaling at this point, and with the kind of variability of how much stuff might be coming through one of our system, our subsystems at any point, we wanted to be able to support that. So that's kind of the under, um, this was back when I was still the data operations engineer. That's sort of what I was thinking about when we made up that term. And we want to make SDR easier to extend. And uh, this is, so our boss, Tom Kramer, loves saying the word APIs right now. <laughs> what we read that to be was we were trying to aim for well-conceived interfaces, boundaries, and understood design instead of focusing on implementing some single technology. Um, and when I say that, it was we started with microservices and ended up with the micromonolith. Um, we did not want to end up with that again, so we were trying to figure out how do we keep those interfaces and those separations really, really clean and crisp and something that the developers will follow. Okay, and that leads me to say uh, something that I think is maybe not internalized even at Stanford yet, which is that the, there's no end result for SDR3. There's not, we're gonna have Cosino one day at Stanford and SDR2 will be off and then we'll be done. We just have too much crap to do that. So we're, the, the whole goal of this process is to have something that we can actually iterate and migrate more readily, whether it's getting a new Hydra head in or deciding to replace our administrative web application with a Hyrax instance and work with uh, someone like UCLA who has a similar use case, or hey, we decide that what we, decide, uh, what we selected for our metadata persistence, we can move it to a faster database. Whatever it may be, it's all about the ability to, to easily do those point migrations in the future instead of having the issue we have now, which is everything so coupled that it's hard to move any part. So there's no turnoff date for SDR2. It's all point migrations and trying to clean it up so it's easier to move those systems. Okay, our new architecture. So what is this thing that uh, all of this process and discussion led to? Um, so Cosina is the given name of this architecture. <laughs> um, I guess it's so if anyone else cares to pick it up, you can pick it up, whatever. But Cosina is the architecture. Taco Truck is our implementation. And Taco Truck's just sort of like a fun, I, I don't know if it's officially going to stay. I started using it because I got tired of being like, well, taco is this part and sopa is that part, but oh, you're talking about refritos. Oh, hold up. No, this won't go in because we're actually connecting it to the, our implementation of it piecemeal over time is just the Taco Truck project. And I, um, I was actually given a little taco truck to put on my desk, uh, so it seems fitting. There's the roadmap. Um, this is actively changing. Uh, we did do that design phase and then a development phase. We're trying our best to have the implementation roadmap for this, um, not have prolonged periods of design without having a development iteration, because we really don't want to design the perfect system and then in the first week of development, we figure, oh shit, we did not understand how that database worked. 
Um, it's a little bit tricky because obviously this is not the only thing that our teams are working on, uh, but we have the idea of we had our first design kickoff, we had a prototype work cycle, we um, went to another design to refine and get community input on our prototype, and then the next steps we're looking at is to try to connect it um, skeleton-wise to uh, a self-deposit application, at least one of the ones that we have, so that we can start looking about how to migrate that. And uh, doing a smoke test of a Google Books ingest, um, because it's a huge amount of a relatively simple object model to make sure that we weren't over-designing to self-deposit. So the conceptual design, and this is pretty simplified. Um, the Taco uh, Truck GitHub page that I shared with you guys has some more information on this. And I would say that this is not, I, mean, I use the term architectural very loosely here. This is conceptual to say these are the subsystems we're thinking about and these are the interfaces we really want to build and try to enforce. Not one box equals one code base. That's, that's not really the way it's looking. Um, so we have, uh, we know we're still going to have a deposit library shared across multiple deposit points because we have multiple deposit web applications as well as assembly, uh, which is just a bunch of Ruby scripts that currently has to run on a server that has God privileges and could take down a whole repository if someone ran a Ruby script incorrectly. Um, so we know we have that deposit library that's going to be shared across those, and it will share interactions with what we've decided to call SOPA. This is our administrative layer. It has all of that recursion and assembly logic, all that really complex business logic that's specific to our repository objects. If I get a geo data set of this type, this is the thumbnail I need to create. This is the technical metadata I need to generate. Here's the data, the metadata I should validate is there. That sort of work. Below SOPA, uh, SOPA, I'm sorry, is designed to have a, a REST API that sits on front of it and would be interactions, like uh, deposit would interact with that REST API. We've sort of loosely sketched that out and um, we'll talk more about that in a second. SOPA feeds into TACO. This is where it all started. TACO is our attempt to do a hard separation of our persistence um, of uh, objects in the management sphere and our crazy business logic for all the variety of types of resources we might have coming into our system. Um, right now, with our use of Active Fedora and a gem that we layer on top of it that has a lot of our business logic, they're really coupled to that persistence layer and we don't want to repeat that mistake. Uh, so TACO is a uh, separate service. It is meant to be stupid. It is a REST API that just takes a resource, and I'll discuss more what that means in a second, but basically a collection object file, and persists it. Gives it an identifier, does some basic validation to make sure it won't kill anything else in our system. We're not doing semantic validation. It's really just are the fields there that we need for processing, and then stores it. Um, we do have where we're separating the metadata and the files, and I'll discuss a little bit more about why we do that in a second. Uh, it does expect a JSON serialization payload, so all of this is moving from having an XML-based metadata schema to a JSON one. Um, and this is where we started our prototype, so we'll hear more about that. We also have this thing called flan or flan. I've been told that flan is how Americans say it if they don't want to sound American, which I guess was my, my bad. Um, but <laughs> Flan is uh, the provenance and status service. This is uh, an event log, and everything that happens in SOPA or in TACO just sends an event to it. It keeps it, and it derives from that a history so that it has the ability to say, hey, here's the identifier for this object. Please give me the history of everything that happened to it for debugging purposes. And it um, derives a capital P provenance, which is a premise-inspired JSON serialization, because we really didn't want to use XML, um, based off of that, with selected events that we know we want to capture in order to be um, a uh, trusted repository. It also has off of that the, um, these uh, queues or streams um, that are indicating that an object has reached a certain status, i.e., a collection was loaded into SOPA. SOPA broke apart all the objects using a change set at that level to manage getting it into TACO. Everything got successfully into TACO. Hey, Flan, this thing is successfully accessioned. And that it should be released to access. Um, so that message gets into that queue. And we have a access um, publication um, consumer 
that says, oh, look, that thing's ready to go. Let me trigger a job that gets the metadata, converts it to the, the form that we want published on um, our access sphere, and pass it through. Same thing for preservation. This thing is now fully accessioned. Please send it to preservation. Um, it gets a message in a preservation consumer, gets the thing, generates in Moab, which is our file specification um, that goes into a bag that uh, is what we ship off to uh, preservation, makes sure it gets preserved, and then sends a message back to SOPA you know, uh, and TACO saying, hey, this thing got preserved and it's preserved here. Um, we are explicitly trying to separate out the state from all of that job processing uh, and to try to make it uh, the source of where we know to trigger some parts, but the triggering is it's really managed by those consumers uh, because of the issue of that 10-year-old asynchronous state processing service we have now that um, has them so tightly coupled that it can be quite hard to debug. Um, on the side, we have this thing called Refritos. That is an asynchronous processing framework. Um, we do have a lot of workflows or dependency graphs that we need to have stuff processed in a certain order. Uh, a great example is I have some records come through that have indicators that there are catalog um, descriptions in our ILS. Please go get that marked data, convert it to what we want, and overlay it in TACO. And we want that to be asynchronous because we need a rate limit calling the ILS. And finally, um, to round this out, up in the top corner, we have hiding Nacho, which is our permission service. And this is the ultimate dad joke. It's Nacho because it's Nacho business. Uh, the permission service is a separate service that takes um, uh, a, an identifier for a user or a group, which are identified um, are, are identifiers that are managed by our university IT. So we have to broker a connection there. Um, identifier for a user or a work group, the action they're trying to perform, or the resource or the class of resource that they're trying to perform it on. And it says yay or nay. Yes, do it, don't, no, don't do it. So that's a very high level quick overview of where we're at. You see the heart of this really are those three uh, flan, taco, sopa. And I just love showing this. This is from actually just over a year ago when I was sitting outside with Aaron Fahey and we were trying to figure out what the core API structure would be for where we could start replacing Fedora. And I drew it out and then she threw it, drew a heart on it and it started the age old um, question of is that a heart or a butt? I think it looks like a butt. But we've been thinking about this for a really long time. <laughs> um, and I mentioned this before, we're trying to go for um, clear interfaces and not complex systems, but complex data. A lot rests on having the relationships and the status and um, all of the processing administration information we need in that JSON payload, not spread across multiple systems where you don't know what you're looking at until you do a couple of different calls against a couple of different things. And so to that, um, you, this is a quick walkthrough of where we've gotten with our data model that can both support the descriptive and, um, well, I'm going to say descriptive broadly practices that we need to have adequate um, understanding of what the resources are, but can also support the kind of data management we need internally to do this sort of complex data instead of co um, in place of complex system. This is a really not well visible overview of our data model. Um, the core here, and I'll uh, describe it because I know it's not easy to read. We're basically using um, PCDM. It's collections, objects. Objects can have other objects. File sets, which we originally called file groupings, and I don't remember why, and files. Each one of those is a resource that has a JSON metadata description in TACO, including files. So we have it all separated, and the actual pointers for containment or membership are keys in the JSON. So it's no cleverness about the file system or anything like that. It does mean that it's um, object focused. Uh, we're not doing two-way pointers because it just gets to be a hard problem to do that sort of data syncing. Uh, we expect that you would start by depositing the object first, and this is the kind of logic that lives in SOPA. Start by creating that object by sending the JSON payload to TACO, get the identifier back, and then say, OK, I see I have a file or a couple of them create a file set, get that identifier back, create the files. And each one of those points to the one above it. Collections then also, our collections would point down. And this means we have to have special considerations on the indices we have at the TACO level to try to get around the age-old collection membership issue. Um, but this is the way we have approached it. 
I would also point out here really quickly, um, for authorization or the, uh, the data that we're having, having uh, stored in that permi permission service, um, we are loosely following web ACL and their modeling. Um, but we don't want to have that dictionary travel around with the object. We really do want it to be stored in that permission service for a variety of reasons. We have multiple points where we might authorize uh, you know, an action, um, some other as well. And then uh, for pointers to uh, other descriptions of the work, namely when, unfortunately it's when and not if, we have a bib frame store for all of our ILS data over on the side. We can just point to the work and say, yep, there's a description over there. We're not going to try to introduce bib frame into our system. On that point, all of this is serialized as JSON, and we use JSON schema to validate it and manage it internally. It is also JSON LD. And what that offers us is that we don't particularly care about linked data in the taco or the back end. We're not doing any semantic webness there. We're not doing any sort of graphiness there. Um, but the JSON LD is allowing our metadata partners to define the semantics that they really care about so that when it gets to the access sphere and we translate it to a serialization that follows a particular schema, a triple IF manifest, uh, mods XML, mods RDF, uh, a bib frame instance, whatever it may be, um, they can know the semantics and have that mapping declared elsewhere and we can do that transformation based off their declarative mapping. So we're not following any shared community schema internally. We are showing um, data models, PCDM, WebACL, but this is not like mods as JSON. It really is our internal JSON shape that we define via these schemas and we expect transformation to the serializations you care about um, on the access side. And if you want to see some of these, uh, there is an SDR3 GitHub repository. It's in Seoul DLSS Labs um, that has our JSON schema that we started with in our prototype. Leading to our prototype, we had a work cycle. Um, it was three months time boxed. We did time box it because this was sort of a greenfield experimentation and we didn't want to get, uh, feel it empowered to get into rabbit holes right away. So we really wanted to try to see if we could crank out some of this core um, replacements for Fedora that we were thinking about. The work cycle goals, I'm not gonna go through all of them, but I just wanna highlight them because I think they help set the context for what we did. The heart of it was we wanted to build Taco and then build out from there as time allowed to think about how we would do CRUD in, of our resources in this new system. Um, if we're really gonna try to knock out Fedora 3 and to knock out our uh, gem that sat above it with all this business logic, let's start there and see what, how would we just do CRUD? Um, that's in the functional goals. There are a couple other ones. I would add for the technological goals, Part of it was testing the feasibility of eventual integration with Hyrax. Part of it was to test throughput scalability performance, because that's something we've struggled with. And there are multiple ways you might address that, but we wanted to try to find the one that was the most maintainable. Um, we wanted to also inform our cloud practices. So during this time, we had been moving stuff to AWS. There was Stanford University IT overall was starting to implement a um, cloud policy or a set of cloud policies for um, IT departments across Stanford campus. So we wanted to use it uh, to test all of the above, all of those things. This is the prototype. This is the early diagram at a very high level uh, from our first like sprint zero um, uh, whiteboarding to think about what we were building. Uh, we knew that we wanted Taco and the right other components to be extensible. We knew we wanted it to replace Fedora 3. I'm gonna talk more about the technology selections we made in a second, which would represent loosely what's here. Actually, I'm gonna do it right now. I, <laughs> I thought I had another slide there. So <laughs> when we were writing this, um, and I would say for everything I'm about to say, it is well documented on the Taco GitHub repository. It was something as part of this work cycle, we really forced ourselves to document early and often. So do check that out if you have questions or you wanna try running it. Um, we decided to go with Go for our programming language, and we decided to use Docker and containerization. Um, our thinking in this area was uh, Go allows the ability to um, make a really clean, small, statically linked binary for a service, and Docker gives us the containerization to ship that binary that does not require an OS, so we have this really light image, 
uh, up to um, AWS and Elastic Cloud Service. It gave us a clear orchestration and deployment pattern that we were um, happy to pick up. We had done serverless experiments, and we actually have another project going on that is following serverless architecture before. And what we had found um, is that orchestration and development practices get tricky when you go with serverless. What does it mean to do distributed development? What does it mean to do local testing? How do you do integration testing? What are the best um, deployment tools if we're not going full AWS and AWS only tools for infrastructure build out? Um, so we decided to go this route. We also, as part of that data forward architecture, um, we wanted to use a REST API specification, and we went with Swagger, which is now Open API specification. Um, this is actually a subset of JSON schema that allows you to define the API and uh, gives you a lot of functionality off of that API definition. We used it, and we actually used API and this uh, Swagger and this library in Go that's called Go Swagger to um, not just specify the API, but to uh, allow us to do a generation of the server code for the prototype. It actually took it and built that server code for us. And there is this concept in Go of a handler, which is um, similar to a type of class that uh, would be that connection to the code we would need to actually write to say, when it gets to this route, here's this operation ID, perform these actions, and that was elsewhere in the code. So we didn't have to touch the generated code. Now, there's an open question about whether or not we would want to use generated code from this library in production, and it's something we're discussing. I mean, it is a well-tested, well-maintained library, but that's always a concern. But for a prototype, it worked pretty brilliantly. Um, we did use AWS, so we were using Docker, and we shipped them to Elastic Container Service, or ECS, using Fargate for the scaling. Uh, we did use Circle CI for continuous integration. We, do all, we normally would use Travis. We moved to Circle CI for this because it had really good integration support with AWS, and it had a Docker-like syntax for describing the um, integration uh, code. We are using Terraform for building out our AWS infrastructure. This is a shift from what we did with other partners in Haiku. Um, Terraform is not AWS specific, which is one of the big reasons we went to it. Um, and it, it allows, you, you can build much more than just uh, cloud infrastructure. We actually had been using it to build some of our on-premise VMs before this point. Um, for the taco persistence, we chose DynamoDB for the metadata persistent, those JSON documents. We probably won't stick with that. We want to change the RDS uh, with a Postgres interface in the future, mainly because of internal indices and limitations imposed by AWS. Um, and we used S3 for binaries. Um, S3 worked brilliantly. It was great. Uh, the only question or concern we have um, from operations is the cost of putting all of our materials in it. Um, so we're considering, actually, uh, operations has a work cycle in the next couple of months to build an S3 uh, implementation, an S3-like implementation on an on-premise um, network, on, on-premise machines. We knew we wanted to be cloud first, but cloud neutral. Uh, this meant we had to have degradation paths where if all of a sudden AWS didn't work or we didn't trust it or we wanted to move to Google Cloud Platform or we decided to go back on-premise, uh, we had to keep that in mind. Um, so Docker was another big reason to do that. Um, ECS, it was, okay, well, anything that can run Docker, it works brilliantly in AWS, we can find that. Swagger was built for translatability, so that seemed good. If Go was really an issue, and this has nothing to do with cloud first, but Go was a divergence from our current emphasis on Ruby, and there is department concern about trying to support too many languages at once. So we could fall back to Ruby if needed, although Go seemed to work quite well. Um, for Dynamo, we would probably use just Postgres. S3, we'd use a file system or the S3 work that's going on. And Kinesis, I'm going to talk about. So Kinesis, um, originally when we prototyped Taco, uh, not everything was um, roses. Uh, we had originally uh, designed for our uh, state management to be a Kinesis stream that came, or Kinesis topic that was filled directly from Taco and it would kick off asynchronous processing jobs from that. That turned out that it put too much intelligence in talk, it was too coupled, it was the wrong design decision, but also Kinesis itself we were using because we have limited experience with Kafka in our department, 
We thought it was a good fit, but Kinesis is not really optimized as an AWS service for the kind of a pinned only history we were thinking about. Um, it's really meant to be just a, a subset of the data visible at a certain uh, period of time for it, the ability to interact with you know, so much like fire hoses of data, which is a great use case for it, but it, it just wasn't ours. So we learned from that. The taco got back up. These are all the code bases links if you care to see. Um, finally, uh, going into community overlap. So that's the prototype. As part of the prototype, or actually even before that, so this is from last January, we did do a Hyrax analysis to see where this would overlap eventually with Hyrax. Um, and when we did that, we were trying to figure out where does Hyrax fit in this from the beginning. And there were mainly, like there were three directions that we could see. One was we don't use Hyrax at all. We kind of didn't like that. We have people in our department who've worked on it. We have a lot of like, interest in supporting this community. So it, this just seemed like a non-starter. Another option is that we could use Hyrax for all of SDR. So this is one of the proposals where it's not just a self-deposit or administrative or management, but the whole thing. Um, and in order to figure out if that was a good option or not, we actually took our generated requirements and mapped them to what Hyrax could do. And we found that only uh, 38 of our core requirements were covered by Hyrax. So we were like, that doesn't seem like a starter as well. Uh, among other considerations about it would be a huge architectural shift for us to move our whole system to Hyrax uh, with uh, Fedora or whatever it may be in the back end. We saw that we had the most alignment with Hyrax in self-deposit. We saw that we had the least <laughs> over alignment with uh, Hyrax in our overall architecture or our processing um, or our back end selections. And so the third option came from that where it was like, we figure out where we integrate Hyrax, but it's not our whole system. And we figure out what the seams are we need to create in our system and what the seams are we need to create in Hyrax for the two to work together. So uh, I'm not gonna spend too much on this because it, it's from January and a lot of this has changed since. But the big idea now is that we look for Valkyrie or another internal seam in Hyrax to have it right to SOPA instead of to Fedora. And we would have Hyrax start by replacing one of our self-deposit applications. And again, SDR3 is not an in-state. Cosina is not an in-state. So we would start there, and then as we start to work on our other self-deposit applications, we would see if we couldn't merge them into that one, or have them also be another Hydra head, or Hyrax you know, head. Um, and as it would evolve over time, we could get it aligned. And I just, I wanted to point that out, especially here, because it's not that we don't, like we plan to return to Hyrax, but a lot of this is figuring out where we can actually cut our code so that Hyrax makes the most sense and still overlaps with what we share with the community with regards to self-deposit. So a lot of this is what I ended up calling seam ripping. So if you figure out where you're gonna tear and like build the interface and have it poured over. We did look at Fedora API. The big takeaway here is um, we didn't see uh, Fedora API being a good use for us at the TACO or even necessarily the SOPA level, and it's because of the coupling with LDP. We aren't producing or managing web resources. We're not producing or managing linked data at that level. We do that in the access sphere. Um, there was also considerations about we want authorization, that permission service, to be not so tightly coupled with our backend. Um, so that was one of the reasons Fedora API didn't work for us. Uh, and I'm gonna skip this and say, we do wanna revisit it though. Like we don't wanna just beat up on Fedora because Fedora <laughs> gets beat up on. Um, and we actually have a different project where we are producing and managing web resources and linked data where the Fedora API is surprisingly apt. And we're looking at how to start working in the direction to use it there. Oops. Um, and I wanted to call out other overlap and influences um, because I think we get into this paradigm where we only see sharing the same exact Hyrax code base as an overlap, but there's so much more than that. Uh, I am so happy to see how many people are talking about AWS and DevOps in this, this conference, and I feel like there's a lot of patterns and practices there that we can share and build upon, even if we're building wildly different systems. Um, I would also say that there are architectural overlaps with Folio, which is an open source ILS um, that we're really keen, it sort of just naturally happened. They are using Go, they're using RAML, which is an API specification, they're using React front ends. We happened to have a presentation from them at a different conference. We're like, oh wow, that 
sounds like what we're doing. That's kind of cool. Um, and Invineo is a, a digital repository system from CERN. So there's interesting overlaps there. We're still, none of this changes our access um, over community overlap. We're still using IIIF. We're still actively involved in Blacklight and Spotlight, all of that work. Um, we see the self-deposit overlap for those front-end applications, and we want to figure out how to approach that where we're not building a house without plumbing, and we can have a house that we all like, like the general architectural pattern of. We're still using PCDM. Um, we hope to, we have active participants in the Oxford Common File System layout discussions, and Moab, our, our specification, has been brought up um, as one of the influences on that. Uh, so we, we also want to look to see how we can share our data specifications, our API specifications, and those JSON schema. And I was very um, encouraged to see that the metadata working group was actually trying to work on this sort of meta modeling in its own way as well. So it seems like a good overlap point there. Um, CodeFlib Spark in the Dark, if you've never heard of it, is a group of people in CodeFlib that are really interested in um, high volume data processing tools. We have learned a lot from them. And I want to see us overlap with not cultural heritage specific communities. Uh, Airflow is an Airbnb workflow management program that actually influenced our refritos pattern a ton. So we're hoping to pick up on work from there. Uh, finally, for community feedback, we did uh, 23 institutions. I basically had two hour calls with them over the last, uh, last month or so. This was to just say, hey, are we idiots? Like, is this completely in left field or in outer space or somewhere? Um, we walked uh, those institutions through our current state, all of basically everything you went through with uh, more technical detail at times. And then we were asking for feedback. We weren't looking for partners. We're not trying to change anything. Actually, a lot of our problems is that we're trying to fix our internal mess before we go back and see where we overlap so we can be better partners, um, <laughs> honestly. So a lot of it was just getting us out of our echo chamber. And this is why I, I explicitly am asking you guys for feedback on all of this. And if you have further questions, happy to get a beer and talk more about it and get your feedback. Um, these are really helpful. It gave us some interesting points. First one is not surprising. Hey, it sounds like it's hella complex. <laughs> How are you going to actually get this done? Yeah, I don't know. Um, pray and drink. I, I'm hoping we can get it. Um, Maybe we can have fewer components with more internal APIs. Are you worried about performance between all of these REST API endpoints? Yeah, we are. Um, we think AWS will mitigate some of that, but it's something to consider. On the flip side, advise to stay with the components that we've outlined. People, some people really like it, and maybe we can share those with the community. OK, that's cool. Um, excitement about our data specifications. I was actually speaking with Declan. He was like, oh, this, this JSON schema stuff is really, really awesome. I want to tell this metadata person. And then he realized he was talking about me to me because I used to be a metadata person. But I guess it's really exciting. <laughs> um, and then there was interest in how we're trying to use Airflow and how we're trying to do that status history work and um, things like Kafka. I'd love to talk more with folks here. And, I appreciated the uh, uh, web syncing presentation from James earlier, actually, about thinking about things like event-driven architecture and how that overlaps. And a lot of this is more cultural changes than it is technical. Uh, trying to make sure we have patterns that the team can pick up, trying to make sure we have ways to communicate specifications and expectations um, that are not just uh, documentation that lives on a Confluence page that never gets read, but actionable, machine actionable. Um, this one was probably my favorite. You were just rebuilding Fedora 3, but with JSON as the serialization. I, OK, I guess I could see that. We are taking out Fedora 3. Guess what? It leaves a Fedora 3-shaped hole. But um, <laughs> that was an interesting one to get. And uh, this is the last one I'm going to end on for feedback. Um, oh, so you guys really don't use Hydra currently? That is a subject of debate <laughs> at Stanford. We do use active Fedora. We use Fedora 3. We use Proto Hydra Rails apps. But then we added a bunch more crap on it. So <laughs> that's sort of an interesting point. What's next? Um, there's basically, there's the steps here. Uh, we're trying to prepare for our next work cycle. Uh, we want to have taco, sopa, flan, a skeleton of it, ready to connect to self-deposit for a certain um, collections and types of objects, and um, start to move that into production. So that some things that we can't load now, like our millions of Google books that we haven't loaded, we could actually load it through this new system and have it connect to our current preservation and have it connect to our current access sphere. At this point, I will stop. Um, I think we have about 10 minutes, and I, or five minutes. 
And I appreciate it. If you don't have time to give feedback now, you can always go to that website and then find us on Slack or email or whatever. So thank you. Oh, you pushed the bottom, I think. Hello? Perfect. Uh, questions? <laughs> it just blew you guys away. <laughs> Thanks, Tom. This is just my opportunity to say, this is more of a comment than a question. Oh! <laughs> Someone no. get him out of here. No, <laughs> but, but seriously, uh, I'm so glad y'all are doing all this work, and thank you so much uh, for, for continually reporting out on it. it it's, it's really great to see how this has progressed over the last couple of months. Thanks, Tom. We are trying to make it transparent and all out there, but I warn you, it's a bit of a fire hose of documentation <laughs> and information. A uh, couple more minutes if anyone has a question. I am happy to stand here awkwardly for like <laughs> five full minutes. It does not bother me. There we go. Thank you. Yay. <laughs> and thank you for being in our workshop on Tuesday. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So my question revolves around the switching Go and Ruby. Mm, yeah. Okay. Is that, that sounded like it would be easier said than done, especially with ECS. I mean, how well does Dockerization work with Ruby apps? That's a good, great point. So if we do go with Ruby, we're adding that OS concern on the Docker image, um, which is the biggest shift. Uh, there's also, um, I mean, the developers disagree on this point between themselves and myself, but uh, the libraries available in one language or the other are better suited to different types of things. So you might have more available in um, uh, Ruby to do some of the data munging we might want, and as well as it's not statically typed, so that's a huge win. But for Go, it does seem to be a lot faster, and it does seem to have some interesting patterns in their libraries that we're trying to pick up. It does have more support for things like Swagger and API specifications of that sort. Um, so yeah, it would be a hard migration I think right there, though, it's, it's more of a political one. If, if there's so much concern that as a department we're spreading ourselves more thin than we already are, um, and picking up a new language would be a problem, then we would have to find a way to do it. Although it's not been a problem so far. So, But yeah, the, the ECS would be fine. It's just the dockerization would suck because we wouldn't have that nice small binary anymore. Uh, we maybe have time for one more, if there's anyone else with a question before we wrap up. Yep, okay. Yay, thank you. Uh, just wondering what your thoughts are on maintaining current operations while developing a new thing, especially yeah. at this scale. Absolutely, that's a great question. Um, and it's something we're struggling with because it's not just maintaining what we currently have running, which is huge, and building what we want new, which is different. Um, and then we also have you know, a portfolio of other projects that have nothing to do with either of these that we have to keep working on. Um, the aim that has worked well in some smaller work cycles is to try to figure out where we can introduce some Cosina patterns or smaller services into work cycles where we're already trying to maintain or build out infrastructure that has problems. Um, and a really, really small example of that is we recently had to rebuild our uh, mark and mods to uh, solar indexing pipelines, because we had multiple of them, we had code all over the place, it was slow, we were having issues with solar loading to um, blacklight. And so as part of that rewrite, we started to think about what we can knock out on the access side so it'd be easier to deal with what we knew was coming down the pipe with, with Cosina. This is a small example. Or to really try to practice um, some of the uh, technical approaches and tools that we thought we were going to use. For the next work cycle we have coming up, I mean, it's, it's under debate right now, and we're going to try to figure that out. But the idea is to try to connect it to one of our self-deposit apps, because we know that that's the thing that we have the least ability to maintain well right now, because it's just they're so old. 
they need to be rewritten. Um, so it's the hope that it, it starts to be a, we put this one new thing in that allows a scene, we build this other, we try to rewrite this other thing that can, that we know we need to rewrite anyways. And between that, that we know there's going to be a period of time where two, we're going to have Fedora 3 and Taco running in parallel, try to minimize that. Um, but uh, part of the planning for that is to figure out how we can do a collection by collection migration. Google Books are such an easy one for us because we, nobody is actively waiting for them to show up in the access sphere. We're not going to get a curator that shows up and says, where the hell are my Google Books? Uh, so we're trying to identify that and move it over piecemeal. But it's, um, it's a balancing act. Like that, uh, that uh, about does it. So uh, let's thank uh, Christina and Hannah for the presentation. Thank you.